first this hour. Mayor Curry is on the cusp of closing out his second term, so we invited him to join us to look back at his time in office and to look ahead at what's next for him and Jacksonville. A lot of questions for him, and we're also taking your calls, 549-2937. Um, if you don't want to sit on hold, tweet us at FCC on air. That's our new handle. Email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org or follow us on Facebook. All right, first thing first, there's a big rumor out here, and I want you to uh, address this. Uh, rumor is uh, people are encouraging you to run for governor in 2026. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing this one of these many people are saying they're going to put their name on it, but is this for real? Well, AG, I'll say, well, good morning. Good morning. Way, it's, good, it's, good, it's good to be with you. Um, uh, I'll say this to that question. Um, I, I don't wake up in the morning with a burning desire to be on a ballot again. Um, but I'm not ruling another run out at some point. But what it, what's really important to me right now is over the last eight years, a lot's happened both in the city and personally for me. So I need to get back to centering my life, kind of reflect on aging, uh, my children. You know, I lost my father a few weeks ago. Um, just kind of reset my life. Um, and then evaluate uh, whether or not uh, running again is an option. I'll say this, um, you got to have the fire in the belly to do something like that. I don't have it right now. With a reset, I may get it. Um, and if I get it and I decide to get on a ballot again, I've never lost an election. So if you got that hypothetical fire in your belly, why governor and why not CFO? I mean, that kind of surprised me because obviously you were in the CFO mix when Rick Scott was governor. Uh, you could have gotten appointed to that. Patronus got that ultimately. Um, he's going to be termed out. So, you know, what would be the calculus behind the governor's office and not CFO if you're to run? Well, if, again, I'm not saying that I'm even looking at running for governor. Uh, what I would say, though, that um, my background and my skill set is that of an executive, both before I was in office and now having been mayor of the city of Jacksonville for eight years. And um, I think if you I believe if you're going to run for something uh, truly as a public servant, it ought to be something that you're hungry for, not a, not something that is a placeholder. I think uh, some people run for office as a placeholder for the next their next thing, and that's just not who I am. Right. I mean, we we've seen that you know people office hop all the time, locally, statewide. I have so. no interest in office hopping. But really, uh, to be clear, it's it's flattering um, that that that's in the conversation. But it's really important that I reset my life right now and find some balance personally, and and with the family evaluate if if another run is in. Me, and the only way I do that is fire in the belly, and the family says yes. Understood. I mean, and obviously, you've, you've had eight years, uh, momentous years, in the mayor's office. A lot of things have happened. And you've had to govern a whole city. A lot of Republicans, um, they get to play to the base because they are in a gerrymandered district or what have you, R plus 15. You don't really have to take any positions. But, you know, you've been a mayor of a Democratic plurality city. You didn't have... Democratic opposition in 2019, but it was still a plurality, and those people voted. Um, and you've had to do some things that may not play well in a Republican primary. Um, HRO expansion, uh, you, you let that happen under your watch. Um, COVID-19 management, I think you signed the second HRO expansion bill, actually, you know, which protects uh, LGBTQ rights, including transgender, which is a big deal now in the current political climate. Uh, COVID-19 mitigation and management. And Jacksonville opened up uh, earlier in a lot of cities, as we know, with the UFC and things like that. But you've had to do things there. Um, you know, so if you were to get the hypothetical fire in the belly and make this run, um, you know, how would you frame these, um, you know, these, these moderate moves? Well, I, I would say, first of all, if I were to be on a ballot again in a Republican primary, I'd be selling a vision about w w where I see uh, us headed in whatever office that would be. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm about blocking and tackling. You know that. So yeah. I'd, I would organize behind the scenes. I'd make sure I could raise the right resources. I'd make sure that the team understood the vision and you just go hard and you sell it. Uh, again, I've never lost an election. Um, that's all hypothetical. Uh, I will say on COVID. Um, yeah. It's interesting as I watch how people rewrite the history and the narrative of COVID. Every single person that was in leadership positions when COVID hit us, nobody knew what we were dealing with. Nobody. Right. So everyone enacted some level of mitigation. And people that say it, it, it everyone did it. 
it would be irresponsible not to do it because we were watching what was happening around the world with hospitals filling up. There was a point where the science scientists were telling us you could get it on a package, you could get it on your countertops. All that proved to be untrue. But when we didn't know much, it was a responsible and reasonable thing to do the mitigation acts we did. Here in Jacksonville, once we got more facts, we opened up pretty fast. So why have we seen this revisionist history? I mean, you're, you're framing it pretty honestly. I mean, there wasn't a lot of information, so you did what you had to do, and once it was safe to open up things like the beach and so on, you did. But, you know, we, we hear it in, in the presidential race for sure. Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump, um, you know, a lot of burying of what they did in office. I mean, you know, Trump does talk about the vaccines, but to hear Ron DeSantis talk, you know, the first year of his COVID mitigation reaction, a lot of that happened here, too, you know, with the monoclonals and things like that. That doesn't get mentioned. Uh, vaccination for seniors first doesn't mention that. A lot of Fauci bashing. So why are Republicans running away from their record on this? Well, I, 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 A.G., I can't answer how any specific person is, is messaging their COVID response. I will say it is a fact that Florida was a leader. The state of Florida under Ron DeSantis was, in fact, a leader in uh, the free state of Florida. I mean, I believe that. Uh, other states were shut down for a very long time when Florida was open and we were, we were able to go to work. Kids were able to go to school. I remember working very closely with the governor in the summer of 2020 to make sure that summer sports were going to be open and that schools were going to be operating in the fall. Uh, and I'm proud of that record. I'm proud of our state for that. Yeah, I mean, and and it definitely is something that, you know, even though it's being memory hold, I mean, there was definitely a lot of careful management of the virus, um, you know, for, for months, really, and until Biden was elected, I think you saw kind of a tone shift from the governor. Um, speaking of, I got one more 2026 question. I apologize for this, but we we loaded it up the front with this because we got, right. we got a statewide audience. There's interest in this around the state. Um, so speaking of blocking and tackling, we're, we're kind of seeing that already. Um, you know, Governor Santos, he's traveling a lot. He's got a press conference today, but, you know, Lieutenant Governor Nunez is um, doing a lot more of the gubernatorial duties. Um, you know, she's almost looking like an incumbent. She's getting that kind of platform where she's able to do these press conferences and do these appearances in lieu of the governor. Um, you know, other people looking at, go at the governor's race, um, Byron Donalds, state representative from uh, southwest Florida, Matt Gates uh, from the Pensacola area, Ashley Moody, the AG. Um, and Gates would probably have the Trump backing, you know, given, you know, how stalwart he's been for Trump uh, you know, 16, 20, and 24. You know, so with the Trump and the Santos endorsements kind of on lock, um, you know, how would you distinguish yourself in that, that field? I mean, the last statewide candidate we had from here was Andrew Crenshaw, and he finished uh, fourth in the four-way primary. Well, again, A.G., that, uh, that, that is a hypothetical that I'm just not prepared to discuss because I, when, I, when we opened, I told you, <clears throat> my yeah. focus is resetting my life right now and my family excuse me, and getting back to bit private sector business. Uh, and, you know, I've got a year, year and a half to evaluate if I want to be on the ballot again, and uh, I'll address that then if I have to. I think it's, 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 it's encouraging that Republicans have such a strong bench of people that could participate in a Republican primary for governor. Um, uh, that's not my focus at this point. Uh, but I will say I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my record, but legislate po policy wise, what we've done eight years, but, uh, I've never lost an election, two runs for mayor. Uh, the first run is, was in a D-plus environment. Uh, elected twice, Republican uh, chairman of the Republican Party of Florida. Multiple elections, uh, uh, local, uh, local chairman and treasurer. So um, if, if I ever get back on a ballot, you can, I can guarantee you the fire will be there and I will be prepared. Right on. And it's 549-2937. Uh, you're listening to First Coast Connect. This is A.G. Gankarski. We're speaking with Mayor Lenny Curry. And um, we have our first caller, um, Matthew from Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to First Coast Connect. What do you got for Mayor Curry? Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, let me just start by saying I did not like your term in office, uh, Mayor Curry. Thank uh, you. But I will temper that by saying that I do appreciate your efforts uh, as far as the removal of Confederate monuments and signing of the HRO. So I, I, I do feel that some of your term, there were good benefits there. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you regarding your uh, your perceptions of the national politics. Um, with everything that's happened regarding former President Trump, you know, the, the lies regarding the 2020 election, the insurrection on January 6th, 
and now recently his indictment regarding serious breaches of national security, would you still vote for him if he won the primary for president, which in all likelihood he seems to be the the leading candidate? Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, The answer is yes. I think Donald Trump had outstanding policies and our economy was humming. Um, National security was uh, our foreign policy was solid. Um, So uh, I look, I will be I will be voting for the Republican nominee in the presidential election. Okay, Um, fair enough. And that's a good answer. Um, I want to turn to local issues in the election we just saw. I mean, you know, that was a, a really combative election. Uh, you you back Daniel Davis heavily support you and su- succeed you in that election. You endorsed him. Um, you were, you know, messaging heavily on Twitter. Um, your political team was engaged. He got through March. Uh, he got through uh, Lana Cumber, uh, Al Ferrero. But, you know, GAP support didn't come through in May, despite the state party, despite the uh, local party being involved. And, you know, he failed where he succeeded twice. And, you know, if we kind of do an autopsy on the Davis campaign, um, you know, he ran to the hard right. You know, you you debated Alvin Brown three times. You challenged him to debate in every city council district. Um, you know, conversely, Daniel Davis skipped one of the debates, you know, for a forum with the sheriff and a blogger who was at the January 6th um, demonstrations at the Capitol. He, you know, whereas you created a lot of earned media opportunities throughout that campaign, every day, every two days. Um, you know, he really didn't do that. And so, you know, when we look at that, um, look at that campaign, what advice should he have taken? I mean, did his political team, um, you know, misunderstand the environment? Did he make those decisions himself? I mean, is the local party to blame? I mean, you know, what, what should he have done differently? AG, it's really hard for me to do an objective autopsy on that campaign because Daniel Davis was not just a candidate that I supported. He's a friend. Um, where our families know each other, our kids know each other. Uh, when you run I and mean, you put it all on the line uh, in an election, I, I can imagine when you lose and he lost, that it's painful and it's hurtful because um, he put everything he had into it. So I, I you know, I don't, I'm not going to do an autopsy on that campaign because he's my friend. Okay. And I care about him. Yeah, I mean, you know, so you basically have nothing to say about political strategy that that led up to the May loss. Correct. Okay. He's, he's my friend, and my focus on him and his family right now is that, uh, you know, that that they uh, they they reset their lives as well, and they get back to some sense of normal. Yeah. Because I can tell you, he wor- he worked his butt off. Okay. You can people can debate, you know, what this this or that, um, and he worked hard, and it just didn't work out. Understood. Um, yeah, I mean, so we look at Deegan's win, and it's like, you know, Deegan won the mayor's election four points or so. You know, we got a Republican, you know, super majority on the city council. Um, so you've kind of got divided government for the first time since 2011 through 2015. Um, you know, what, is, what does that mean for the city? I mean, it's like, is, is Jacksonville performing more democratic? I mean, you know, obviously the council map is drawn a certain way. And at large districts favor Republicans, but is this really a democratic city or is Deegan an anomaly who managed to you know, get crossover support? Uh, I, I don't know that she's an anomaly. She got crossover support based on the campaign that she ran and the message that she had. I got crossover support in, in, in 2015. We had a D plus environment. So I just think Jacksonville, you know, people try to, to pigeonhole Jacksonville is either Used to say we were red, then they said we moved purple. Some say now we're moving <clears throat> blue. I think in these big elections, the people of Jacksonville are pretty open to, um, particularly in citywide elections, they're pretty open to crossing party lines. We've seen that more than once. So, you know, going back to not crossing party lines for a second, we got a question from a listener. Does the outgoing mayor really believe, and I'm quoting here, that driving businesses and taxpayers out of Florida for being quote unquote woke is a good idea. How do you feel about the war on woke? Um, I, I don't, the question is, I don't think we're driving businesses out of the state of Florida. Uh, I, I will say this. I mean, people can have the debate of what woke means or what that means. I don't want my children. Uh, I don't want my elementary age children. They, they're not anymore, but when they were or my middle school children, uh, being taught about sex in school. I want them to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
and they get that other stuff at home. Parents have the right to teach their children, expose their children to what uh, they want to in their homes. Okay, we're about to take another call here. Um, we have about 14 minutes left, so... And by the way, my position on that is very reasonable, and most Americans, Republicans and Democrats and NPAs, agree with that position. Understood. The, the national media would try to have you believe otherwise, and that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so we got, um, yeah, basically 13 minutes at this point. Um, so I'm going to take a call here. Um, I'm going to ask callers to keep it to about 30 seconds. Um, do not like give a long speech and we're trying to get quick answers, quick questions. Um, Susan from Mandarin, uh, welcome to first coast connect and go ahead. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I have two questions. Well, First, make them quick. Advice, you got 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. What advice do you have for incoming mayor Donna Deegan? And two, how do you feel about Jason Gabriel's ruling saying that shall means must? And do you think it hurt the school board and having a powerful mayor that uses the um, general counsel to hurt other parts of the administration? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, you can go ahead and um, take those um, in sequence. Yeah. I would, so I'm, <clears throat> Going to be very careful not to give advice to an incoming mayor, particularly on policy, because I, she won the election. Mayor elect will be mayor in a week, and um, it's it's hers at that point. But I would say, on a personal level, uh, I would say um, the schedule of the office can eat you alive if you're not involved in scheduling. Make sure that you do not let it uh, infringe on your time with your family. Make sure you find balance there. Um, I figured that out pretty quickly, and I think I was pretty successful at it, although not perfect. The other thing is whatever it is that you do to blow off steam, I know that our mayor-elect is a runner. Uh, keep running. Do, yeah. not, do, not, do not let that office take away that which is, which is good for you and healthy for you. Yeah, I mean, I remember you were running through Hem Hemming Park when you first started. Uh, people were kind of surprised to see that. Alvin Brown didn't do much running through Park. Um, you know, speaking of the Deegan administration, um, you know, I want to talk about the transition very quickly. Um, you know, did the her winning change the calculus of your team? Like, how's your administration facilitated this transition compared to say, and what lessons may you've learned from 2015 with Alvin Brown's transition to you guys? Uh, well, look, I'll say in my transition, uh, I had a great team around me that uh, you'll remember. I had Susie Weil, Sam Musa, Tom Petway. Uh, they brought in a team of workers as well to w begin working the, the budget process immediately. Uh, so I, I had no concern um, as, as I was being sworn in as to what budget I would present. Uh, we have been working, my team has been working very closely with the Deegan team, Mayor like Deegan's team, um, and I think that uh, they're going to be ready to roll July 1. Yeah, and you, you actually ran against one of the, the team members, um, Incoming CFO Anna Brochet, obviously Mike Weinstein's in the, in the job through uh, September, but Brochet takes over in October. Um, you know, when you look at her hires, Karen Bowling, Brochet, uh, Karen Bowling is obviously from the Alvin Brown administration, Rick Scott alum also. Um, you know, how do you evaluate her new team? I mean, do you, do you see them as like your team, basically workers ready to go? Uh, look, I think, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that, the mayor elect has assembled a team that she, that, that 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 she has the she's the mayor she's going to be the mayor so I, I I don't think it would be appropriate for people to um to criticize her picks um uh, my, some of mine were criticized in the beginning for various reasons that's what happens um they get the opportunity to be sworn in July one and then go prove themselves that's how this game works uh -huh. uh, and we've seen a history of mayors where some have had a rough first year some have had a rough couple of years. Uh, others haven't. Um, my rough stuff didn't start till the second term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it it got it kind of got complicated. I I think the privatization effort of JEA sort of. Um, Come on, AG. That was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it 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 overshadowed the 2019 campaign, and you know, really kind of overshadowed a lot of your second term. And even now, you got Aaron Zahn, you got Wanamaker. They're they're in a federal court, and obviously, there's a lot of delay motions. So who knows when they actually go to trial? Um, do you regret the Aaron Zahn hire in retrospect? Uh, well, let's, let's, let's talk about the big picture. All right. The, the conversation around privatization and the value of the asset, uh, I believed then and I believe now. Um, the process could have been run differently. Um, if I had to do it over again, I still would have said we should understand the value 
and we should understand what the best way forward. Should we monetize it in some way or not? What I would do, what I would do differently now is I would ask a third party, maybe the Civic Council or some other organization, hey, can you guys take this and study this on your own, present it publicly, and then we can have a discussion. I think there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding and miscommunication. Frankly, there were a lot of lies that were told about me and my team. Look, I signed up. I, I'm, I was on the ballot. So people can lie about me. They can criticize me. That comes with the job. But the lies that were said around the people that work for me, that report to me, that bust their butt for this city every day, that, that have proven to be lies at this point, um, that, that just ang- that angers me for yeah, them I, and their families. I, I understand that. People but... around me's families went through a lot of crap because of people that wanted to hurt them because they had interest in the JEA. They didn't want it privatized for reasons of their own self-interest. I understand that. That said, that said. If you look at Aaron Zahn and the, and the PUP plan and the kind of enrichment, it's kind of like a big scheme in gambling where they were getting 10% off the top. I mean, but that like had nothing. But that guy. had nothing to do with the, the people that thought understanding the value and privatization of the asset, we should have that conversation. That was a separate issue done in the organization of the JEA. So, so Zahn basically went rogue. That was not part of the privatization. Look, there's going to be a trial, and a jury is going to make a decision on what happened there. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to ask about that. Um, pension reform, obviously, this is an issue that was up in the campaign. Um, you know, there's, there's momentum to go back to an FRS plan or something like that. That seems to be what the public safety unions want. Uh, Deacon was open to it. Uh, Davis was also open to it. Um, and it, it feels like there's something where the police union, even though they were leveraged against Deegan during the campaign and you know, fire union to a lesser extent, you know, they're, they're going to pressure on this. Well, first I would say, I don't think there's not a discussion to go back to pensions. Is there? Well, I mean, because if they go back to pensions, yeah. they lose the half penny. If they lose the half penny, the budget is garbage at that point. There's no money to invest. Had we not done the pension reform that I did my second year, there would be no money for this. There would be no. The CIP, the infrastructure budget the year before I was in office, was $20 million. Right. It's over $300 million now. We would go back to $20 million. You want a stadium deal? There's no stadium deal if you go back to old, old school pensions. Now, FRS, I can tell you the legislative. And remember, we had to take this through the Florida legislature. I do remember. The House, Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican Governor. Right. The legislative intent was to go to 401k type plans. If I had gone to FRS, if I had told them I was going to FRS, that would have never gotten through Tallahassee. We would have never had pension reform, and our city would be broke today. So, so basically, your read on the law is that um, once pension reform happened, that foreclosed defined benefit plans, period. Yes. Okay. Because there are a lot of people saying, well, you could start another plan um, and basically kind of wriggle around it a little bit. But. Well, hey, look, AG, maybe they'll prove me wrong. And that's what, you know, a, a new mayor and a new team and, and the city council get to decide. And if they prove me wrong, God bless them. It's my, my term is over. Yeah. Uh, and they get to try to do what they want to do. And if they're successful, God bless them. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, my understanding is there's a huge cost to that, that the city cannot afford. Understood. We're going to take another call. Five, four, nine, two, nine, three, seven. We got, Rick from Arlington. Uh, Rick, uh, you're on the air. What's on your mind? Uh, hi, Mayor Curry. Um, there are a lot of voters here in Jacksonville who just don't believe that you did not try to sell JEA out from under them and are not convinced by the things that you said. I'm wondering if you can help us understand how you were not in favor of that sale. Okay, thanks a lot, Rick. Um, yeah, obviously you got, you got a, a question here. On yeah, the thanks for your question. I was in favor of understanding the value of the asset and evaluating whether, evaluating whether or not a sale made sense. Uh, we never got to that point. I, I think I said that 10 minutes ago. I stand by. I stand by that, unfortunately, because of how ugly it got. You will not see that discussion in this city for a very long time. And another ugly discussion, and it's a, it's a smaller dollar sign, but Confederate monuments. Um your administration came out for removal. One is gone. Um, the one in Springfield Park still stands. Um, and, and this is despite having an advantage in city council. You couldn't get through council. Um, Donna Deegan is a anti-monument too. She wants to see them relocated, et cetera. Um, is this possible with the city council being where it is? I don't know the answer to that question. I will say, you know, it, in sound bites, it's hard to get the nuance of these policy issues. Uh, I, I'm not for removing history. I'm not no. against people being able to understand and celebrate their history. I simply 
came to the conclusion personally as the mayor of this city uh, that 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 those monuments should not be on on tax funded taxpayer funded property. Um, they should just be somewhere else. Uh, people could disagree with me on that, and it's okay to have that disagreement. I was elected twice, and I got to make that decision. I wasn't successful in full removal, and we'll see what the next administration does. Yeah, and, and another thing for this administration coming in, the, the Jaguar Stadium deal. I mean, obviously you're an advocate of it. Um, I understand your administration was talking to Mark Lamping prior to the memorandum of understanding that outlined the uh, – roughly billion dollar city commitment they're looking for. Um, does Deegan have room to move on this deal? I mean, people are saying, well, you know, cut down the, this, the district or, you know, why, why are we spending 67% of the stadium or things like that? Is there room to negotiate with this ownership? Um, or is it something where they're seriously looking at moving if they don't get a deal in place and ground broken well before 2030? Um, all my experience with the team is they're committed to Jacksonville. Um, and I've spent a lot of time with them over the years. I know them personally. I know Shad and Mark personally. Uh, I do think that, yeah, the, the new mayor, the new administration will have room to negotiate. But I think people need to be realistic. And you need to understand you, you, the ownership in the city can just cannot create a deal and that the deal's done. The NFL has to approve this. Other owners have to approve this deal. So it's not necessarily just what Jacksonville wants. It's what's the national market for NFL stadiums. And what does our market look like? What are recent stadiums? Nashville and Buffalo are the two recent deals, right? Right. And they're similar markets, right? Yeah, but there's, there's state buy-in on those deals. Okay, forget state buy-in for a minute. Just look at the finance of it and the, 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 the structure of the deal, the dollars. That's what is a blueprint. Not that Jacksonville will look exactly like Nashville and Buffalo, but I believe that's what the NFL would look to see something like. So whether it's state dollars or city dollars, it's government dollars, right, once you pull it all together. Do we have the bonding capacity to do a billion dollars over 30 years? I mean, Our city is in great financial shape. We've paid off every budget that I presented. I made sure my team, we paid down debt every year. We've paid down over a half of uh, over $500 million in debt since I've been in office. Our credit ratings have been upgraded. Uh, city's finances are, our reserves are through the roof. We've put a ton of money in reserves. The city of Jacksonville is financially sound and strong. How would interest rates ad address this? I mean, I remember when, when Musa was in your administration and he would talk about, well, this is free money, <laughs> basically because interest rates are so low and you can move like capital budgets. Right now, you know, we're in, in a more um, unforgiving interest rate environment. We don't know what the Fed's going to do. Um, would that affect the cost of money down sure, the road? Sure, sure. I think that's why the next presidential election is going to be so important in my view. Understood. Um, you know, I, I did want to ask you about schools because, you know, we're, you've worked with two superintendents. Um, you know, you worked with Nikolai Vitti, um, who the chamber and, you know, business interests really liked. Um, there were elements who did not like him, including Corrine Brown at the time. Uh, Diana Green, um, she had a lot of successes, including... You know, she worked with you in the school tax, the school sales tax, but obviously it ended um, rough for her. Um, you know, we're, we're in a more politicized era statewide. Um, you know, Ron Santos and the Board of Education, we got local Esther Bird on that. Uh, Manny Diaz from South Florida is a commissioner. Um, is being superintendent a tougher job now, given um, the scrutiny from social conservatives, Moms for Liberty? Um, there looks like they're going to bring back back Addison Davis, which, uh, you know, he's been here before. Um, he knows how things work here, but you know, are we past the year where we can expect four or five years or is the next superintendent going to have to play the culture war game better than Diana Green did? Um, I think it's a tough job. Um, in fact, you know, ha having eight years been in public scrutiny, whenever I see a high profile elected official, uh, under, uh, consistent, uh, consistent media attack. Um, I feel for them. I, I've reached out to Diane at Green recently. Um, whether you agree or disagree with their positions, you feel for them as a person because I've lived it. But it's a tough job. The next superintendent, yeah, is going to have an incredibly tough job. But that's okay. It should be a tough job. Feel, talking about our kids. But is it necessarily tough? I mean, when Rick Scott was governor, you know, you didn't get a lot of these, the social pressure. In fact, you know, DeSantis early on his first term didn't care about DEI. In fact, was positive on DEI. Now, you know, he's the ice part of his campaign speech. 
Um, a- AG, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning. I, I don't think, I mean, look, I, my, my kids were in public schools at some point. They, yeah. they largely had a good experience. There were some things that were happening in, that, uh, that I, once I learned about, I wouldn't necessarily be an advocate for Such as? in public schools. I'm not going to get into it, gotcha. but I will, I, will get, I will go back and say this. I don't, our children, th- th- this, this attack on Ron DeSantis, they say this don't say gay bill, this had, nothing, rights and education. This, had, this had nothing to do with don't say gay. That's a media-created narrative. This was about not having children, elementary school and middle school children, being taught about sex. Talk, I mean, come on. Yeah. This is a reasonable position. So, so why does he present it in this way that comes off as unreasonable? I don't know that I agree with that. I mean, it, it seems like he presents it in a very strident way who, you know, sort of, going after critics and it seems to polarize the issue but i but i think look messaging aside everyone chooses to message the way they want to our children our elementary school our middle school children should not be talking about their sexuality with their teachers that's a in-home conversation yeah speaking of messaging um i i want to talk about social media for a little bit and (laughs) that'll be fun (laughs) yeah and and this is getting closer to the last question because at 9 40 we've got a heart out here but um you know, on, on Twitter, you've been kind of pugnacious over the years. Um, you've kind of told people where you could go and what they could do uh, when they crossed you. Uh, you turn off replies for a long time. Um, you know, looking back, do you wish you had moderated a little bit? And are you going to turn back on replies at some point? Yeah, I wish I would have moderated. Here's what usually happens when I, when I tell it like it is. It builds over time. It's, yeah. usually, it's usually a person that's been bam, 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 bam for months, and I just have had enough. Um, so I'll say this, I don't tweet things or say things that I don't mean. Um, I do wish that sometimes, uh, many of those times I had just not said them. I just kept them in my brain. <laughs> so, so what was the thing, what was the trigger that made you kind of, you know, take off your seven second delay and just kind of like, you know, put it out there and like, you know, I'm going to let it fly. I've just had enough. Yeah. What, what are you going to do to me? And, and the other side of me is like, what are you going to do to me? It's come on. It's, it's, it's Twitter. It's social media. People act like the people talk about getting ratioed like it's painful. Right. What a wimpy generation of people. <laughs> you got ratioed. That somehow hurts. Go out and do something hard. Get off of the computer, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. And I, I've been ratioed once or twice, so I know how it goes. No big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, Mayor Curry, I mean, we, we got to a lot of questions here. A couple callers are hanging out. They're not going to get to them, unfortunately, because we're ending at 940. Um, in about 30 seconds, um, is there anything we didn't get to that you want to mention? Um, yeah, a couple things. I, I just want to say how grateful I am for the people that serve the city of Jacksonville with me in leadership roles, CAA, chief of staff, uh, CFO. I mean, the list goes on and on. All the department heads, all the department, the city, people have worked so hard behind the scenes. People don't understand how much everyone cared for this city. We got this city operating in 2015, and it is it is in good shape for for the next mayor and the next administration. Um, and I just want to thank the people of Jacksonville. Uh, you know, we talk about social media is ugly. When I'm in public, I don't I've I don't think I've had three bad experiences in public since I've been in office. People are nice. People are kind. Democrats, Republicans, NPAs, Independents. Um, so I'm just I'm honored and grateful to have had this job and. I'm ready to rebalance my life and be normal again. Hey, uh, I, I look forward to that, and congratulations. Thanks for doing the interview.